before we go into the details of this release, uh, I wanted to briefly walk everybody through uh, what we are doing here at Control Up. I know that not everybody on this webinar um, uh, is as familiar with what Control Up does. And, you know, even for those people who know Control Up, I kind of wanted to go over some of the changes uh, we've made to, you know, the solution stack we have. Uh, we've been around for, what is it, 12 years, maybe 14 years. I, I kind of, you know, stopped counting the years. And obviously, we've always been very strong in monitoring VDI and DAS environments. And uh, over the last few years, we actually expanded what we can monitor and kind of like the, the full end-to-end -end picture we, uh, we, we can provide you with. So let's talk a little bit about that. And uh, what we talk about these days and what the market kind of like started to, to call uh, end user experience monitoring is digital employee experience. And what we do is digital employee experience management, but how does that relate to the employee's digital experience? And for that, we first need to kind of look at how employees interact with technology in the workplace. So first of all, you know, and this is something that you know, the pandemic didn't change it. It maybe accelerated it, but employees nowadays have a much different expectation about how they use technology in the workplace. Uh, they, of course, want to want it to be frictionless, but they also want it to be available to them whenever they work. Uh, you know, if I look at myself when I joined Control Up uh, just over two years ago, uh, I I started as a remote employee. Uh, I actually had my interview in person with one person, and then after that, everything started shutting down. And uh, my workday is not nine to five. Um, and sometimes I start earlier. Uh, we have a lot of uh, colleagues in Israel, so for me that often means earlier. And you know, I kind of like want to want to you know, decide when I want to work. Obviously, the location where I work. Uh, Currently, I'm at home in my home office. I'm actually going to go to the airport after this uh, because I have to, uh, unfortunately, take a flight. But working from other locations, you know, I want to have that flexibility. It's no longer kind of like determined by the employer. Right? The employee uh, definitely got more power when it comes to uh, uh, making those decisions. And I guess unless you work at uh, Tesla, then, uh, then you don't have a choice. Um, on the other side, we still have our IT teams delivering the technology. And a lot of these technologies, you know, used to kind of live in the data center, maybe in cloud services, but their tools they were using were also kind of like tailored towards this, hey, I have visibility of the network, I have visibility of the technologies, and that is no longer true. So a lot of our customers, uh, you know, kind of like lost some visibility and, and understanding if they're actually meeting the employee expectations. And this is where DEX management tools come in. So DEX management tools is really about measuring and improving the quality of an employee's interaction with technology in their work environment. And Control Up does this in various ways. So if you look at our overall platform, uh, we are no longer just VDI. Um, any digital work style, whatever you use, if that is physical endpoints or virtual endpoints or VDI and DAS, uh, if you use SaaS or web applications, something that of course has significantly changed over the last few years is the usage of unified communications tools. It really doesn't matter how you work. And honestly, I use all four of these on a daily basis in combination with each other. Um, and Control Up will be able to bring in the data from the employee, so the contextual information like user sentiment. Uh, we talk about that more next week. Um, um, and in a couple of weeks, we have a webinar. I'll, talk, uh, I'll, I'll tell you more about this later on. Uh, but it also brings in data from my local network. For example, my local Wi-Fi, my local ISP connectivity from wherever I work. And on the other end, we bring in all these metrics that are coming from physical endpoints from VDI, from Citrix, VMware Horizon, Nutanix, all these kind of like different things, as well as unified communication, SaaS application monitoring. And we create a complete picture of the performance usage and availability of these technologies and bring that into our platform, which we refer to as the DEX fabric or digital employee experience fabric. 
And from there, we provide IT with the tools to be able to remediate and automate and in short, optimize the digital experience. So the thing we've always been doing for VDI, you know, we now do for physical endpoints, for SaaS applications, for unified communications tools and everything in between. Right? Because if I'm using a SaaS application uh, and I have an issue with it, it's slow or not performing or not available, what is the issue? Is it my, my physical endpoint? Is it the browser on my physical endpoint? Is it my local Wi-Fi? Is it the SaaS platform? Uh, you know, there's all these things in the technology chain where you need to keep an eye on. And we are able to do all of those things. So to kind of like summarize this, Control of the DEX management platform gives IT teams a comprehensive, comprehensive end-to-end view, no matter the way your employees are working. For physical endpoints, VDI and DAS, we collect uh, metrics or additional information like user sentiment and contextual information to actually give those metrics meaning. And we also do this now for SaaS applications and very soon for unified communications. We will have some announcements tomorrow. Uh, so keep an eye on our blog. Uh, uh, we have some exciting new enhancements coming, especially for the stuff here on the right, the, uh, the orange and purple circles. All right, but today we are here to talk about VDI uh, or virtual apps and desktops. And um, this is of course where we've been developing solutions for over a decade. And this really allows you, our customers, to monitor and improve the digital experience for virtual desktop and apps, no matter if that is Citrix or Horizon or Microsoft AVD or even RDS for those people that use it, and no matter the te underlying technologies in your environment. So today uh, we are going to walk you through some great enhancements. So I know that Trenton, when he starts his demo, he will kind of like do a short refresh of you know what how how this all works with 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 Control of Solve and the real time console. Uh, but after that, he will go into five uh, new enhancements, new features in Control of Real-Time DX, which is the product name for our VDI solution, including updates to our logon duration analysis. We have some great new metrics for Citrix PVS. Uh, there are some really cool trigger and script enhancements he, uh, he will show uh, um, uh, during the demo. And uh, towards the end, we will talk a little bit about how you can use our new PowerShell CMD Labs to um, improve automation and reporting. And we will briefly touch, because this is a very particular audience, uh, um, uh, we also released a management pack or releasing a man management pack for VMware VROP. So for those people on the call who are using that, uh, we will uh, briefly touch on that, but expect more, uh, more information coming out on that uh, pretty soon. So without much further ado, um, Trenton, it's uh, over to you. So let me stop the sharing here. Awesome, thank you. All right, just to be clear, you can see the solve screen. Is that right? Okay. Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> thank you so much, Joel. Um, so just to, to recap, you know, like uh, Joel was saying, Control, we're a, a a real-time monitoring remediation platform uh, that can also do so much more to help out your digital experience. Uh, so once you have control up in your environment, we stand up uh, an instance of Solve in our cloud-based uh, deployment. And you can see this is what Solve provides now. So it's providing us a web-based view of all of our different metrics. This is the dashboard view. So we can see all the different things uh, within it. We can actually customize the dashboard to whatever we want. Um, we can add individual machines, hosts, uh, folders and whatever within control up so you can get a good view of, of what's going on. Um, so what I'm going to start with is I'm just going to start with just the basic troubleshooting flow and how a real time uh, product can help you in that regards. So I'm going to click on the discovery here and this is going to take us to our uh, topology bar up top or I can expand out our tree view if I want to focus on a particular resource and you define this all within the control of console. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to focus on our data center here and get that high level view of what's going on in our environment. Uh, I can immediately see that we have, uh, you know, a high stress level for our six, seven hosts, and I've got a medium stress level for our HQ data center. Um, I can see that I've got this metric here. Our host average disk IOPS is quite high. 
Uh, for the HQ data center, this is an unusual metric, and that's why it's color coded red. It shouldn't be red. It should it should be green, which means that there's some kind of health issue. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drill into this. I'm just going to click on the clusters here, and this will break out the clusters that we see within Control Up. Uh, so I can see cluster one here is the one that seems to be having the I/O issue, and so again, what I can do in order to to get into this further is I'm going to click on the host button here to drill into the hosts that we're focusing on. And here we can see we've got two hosts that have the health issue that we're talking about. We can tell that because the stress level is high and the stress level is an aggregate metric. So it looks at all the different metrics for that particular resource. And if there's a weighted average, you can apply to them. And as um, a metric starts getting into an unhealthy state, it increases the stress level. So you can get that high level overview as to what's going on. So as I continue to scroll right, we can see everything's green up until we hit the data store metrics. So there's something unusual going on in our data store here. And if I wanna troubleshoot this further, what I can do is I can click on this little arrow here, and this will take us into our virtual expert within Solve. So clicking on this, um, it's now drilling us into that host and it's showing us all the virtual machines that are on that host. We can see it's colored by blue here. It's a nice light blue color. This is all the disk related metrics because we clicked on a disk related column um, for the host within itself. So we're looking at all the virtual machine disk related metrics and we can see that it's all red for this one machine. The rest are looking pretty green, so that's good. So that means that this guy tends to be having some kind of health issue. Um, I wanna get to the root cause of this issue. I know it's a virtual machine, I can reboot it, I can you know shut it off or do whatever, but maybe it's providing some kind of service uh, that's critical to the business. So I want to find out what's actually consuming all these resources. So again, I'm going to click on the arrows again. And this will now drill us into the machine. And you can see the topology bar, the way that we've navigated through here, it's highlighting out the different areas of interest that we can see. So we went from the HQ data center to the host, to the virtual machine, now to the sessions on the machine. And here now I can see an individual session looks like it's causing our health issue. So Steve IO, um, again, disk related metrics are being shown here because we we're just drilling into disk related things. And I can see the in out and uh, read and write operations are in red. So they're having some kind of health issue. So now if you look at our troubleshooting flow here, we could have rebooted the VM um, in order to solve this issue. But now we can see that there's just an individual session that might be causing it. So instead of rebooting the VM, we could actually just log off this user or do some other remediation action to him or even reach out to him and say, hey, what's going on? Um, but again, I still don't know the root cause of what's causing this issue. So again, I'm going to click on the arrows to drill into his session, and we're going to look at all his processes in his session. And boom, we can see again, uh, we've got one process called Dynamo.exe. It's in red for the read-write operations. Um, it's got the other operations here that look like they're, they're quite high, especially in comparison to the other processes. Uh, we can see it's consuming a lot of CPU. So uh, I suspect the dynamo.exe is actually what's causing our, our issue. And so now we could terminate that application. And how we can do that is if we switch over to the console view, this is actually what gives us our ability to remediate um, at the moment until we get actions within solve. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna follow the same flow here. So I'm gonna focus on our host view. Here's our critical host. Here's our high IOPS. And so I'm just going to follow the same flow, navigate through the machines view. Again, it's highlighting the column of interest. It thinks it's causing our issue. Again, we get that same virtual machine being displayed saying that it's uh, sick or it's unhealthy. And so again, I can click on this again uh, to drill into it. Let's go mouse and I'll go to the sessions view now. And so again, we can see that same users being displayed. And again, this is all the same data. That's why everything is consistent. And so again, I wanna drill into this user session. So I'll click into it and go down to the process view. So almost the exact same thing you saw before, but now we're gonna take a remediation action. So what I could have done with this user is I could get a session screenshot and all of this is role-based. We can actually disable all these options depending on your role. So help desk can't get a screenshot. Maybe they can only get it with user notification or approval. Um, for me, I'm just gonna, do this here without notification so we can get a, a sense of what they're doing. And here we can see uh, he's, you know, he's running a program called IO meter and we can see that it's updating. So it looks like it's running properly. It's not stuck in an infinite loop. It's not frozen or hung, just consuming resources. It's actually operating. So 
um, you know, a bit of an interesting thing, what he might be doing here or she. And I want to take a, a remediation action. So um, I do a Google search. I find IOMeter is actually like a performance testing tool for disks. Uh, so this user, I'm not entirely sure what they're doing. They haven't been responding to my messages. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start throttling this CPU uh, on this individual process. So we can see it's at about 20% right now. I'm going to hit OK here. We get the little bang showing up saying that it's applied its action to this process. And we'll see, boom, the CPU just drops down immediately. And again, we're in now in a real-time context with the real-time console. And as we make changes to these resources, we can actually see the impact of cause and effect. We can actually see by reducing the CPU utilization on this process that the in-out read operations per second has dropped significantly. So pretty cool. Um, and that's one way that we can, uh, you know, do remediation to, to the things that we see in here. So that's control up and it's troubleshooting capabilities in a nutshell. And now uh, I know we're all here to look at the exciting new features of 865. And I know I'm quite excited to share that uh, this is a, quite a big point release or quite a big minor version point release in, in my opinion anyways. Um, and the first thing I'd like to start with is looking at uh, our improvements to our log on duration. So one of the things that we found when we were working with customers and working at customer sites that uh, our, our customers, they have you know, very complex environments. They've got all these different features and settings um, that are enabled in all their different environments. And we were seeing things like this. We were seeing you know, super long logon times for some particular users. Uh, but when we did the analysis of that, we actually saw that their logons were actually very, very fast. Right? They were in the, the realm of like 10, 15, maybe 20 seconds, but the logon times were reporting you know, these crazy numbers of like 160, 200 seconds, really bizarre sort of things. And so when we started to investigate further, what we found is that these customers, the common thing that they had was the legal notice duration being enabled. And so what is the legal notice duration? Um, so the legal notice is when you have that banner that shows up that you have to click okay on for a logon uh, in order to get past it and actually continue your logon cycle. Um, you know, internally, we've kind of joked, it's the coffee time. People will go and they'll click the resource. Uh, they'll go get a cup of coffee. They come back and it's sitting at that screen waiting for them to hit OK. They hit OK and then they have to wait another 30 seconds. Not the expected behavior that they were doing, but that's what it is. Um, and what we found is that this is getting added on to the logon duration. So we can actually see here with this particular user here, uh, top fault, um, he sat at the logon notice duration for 25 seconds. And the way that we used to measure logon duration was very similar to Citrix right here, how it would show something like this. It would show like a 90 second logon time. But we know that's not accurate because we know that it was sitting there waiting for some kind of user interaction. So what we did at Control Up is we did a whole bunch of research to discover what we need to do to track this particular phase of the logon process. And we've discovered that, we've put that into code, and now it's here available for you. And now what we've done is we'll actually subtract the legal notice duration from the logon duration amount that we actually display within Control Up. And what that gives you is that this gives you an accurate depiction of how long your logons are. And then we can also look at the legal notice and say, well, okay, how long are our users actually sitting at the legal notice? So we get these really cool values that we can see, um, and you can see the difference between them. So like. Uh, Joel looks like he just logged on here. He had 19 seconds at the legal notice. And again, if we were using our old metrics, we could see it would have been around 57 seconds, which isn't accurate. It is more closer to the 33 second time. So super cool. This will give you more visibility into the logon process uh, and uh, give you more accurate timings for how long your users are actually taking to log on. Uh, so you know where to put your effort and focus on optimizing your logons. So we think that this is a super cool feature, super easy to do. Um, just upgrade the agent with Control 865 and boom, you have this feature. Uh, one caveat for this feature is it operates differently, uh, not, not Control Up per se, but the way that Windows operates. It actually Windows actually operates differently between desktops and server-based operating systems. Um, so for desktop-based operating systems, Windows will connect you to the console session and it'll show the logon duration banner. And then once you hit OK, then it will authenticate you. Uh, if that happens, sometimes the legal notice duration won't be displayed. 
Um, but for server-based OSs, if you have the legal notice duration, you always authenticate first, and then it shows you the legal notice banner. And then once they hit OK, it goes through. So for uh, multi-session machines, it should always be there. And for desktop machines, um, I'm having a bit of a hit and miss depending on what version of Windows you might be running. So the latest version of Windows 10 and Server 2019, you can see here, does display it correctly. Hey, Trenton, oh. uh, since you're still log talking about log on durations, a question came up from Chris here. Um, Log on time is being skewed by time zone changes that occur after the control of service starts. Has there been any improvement there? I know it's not particular to 865, but do you uh, do you know? Uh, so my understanding of that is no, we rely on the timestamps. Oh, within... no, hold on. I, I see Yoni is like, uh, like uh, here, I'm just going to uh, say, we finally fixed that. So. Oh, I, I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice little surprise hidden feature then. Awesome. Um, okay, so yes, we do support recognizing time zones and adjusting the SKU accordingly. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, so this is... Yeah. Th th thank you. Yeah, sorry. I'm still looking at Joni's answer. Uh, well, I'll type, I'll type the answer in the Q&A uh, with, with the details on that, with the version details. So thank you, uh, Joni. And uh, sorry, Trenton, for the interruption. Go ahead. Yeah, no worries. <clears throat> so that's what's new with uh, our log on duration metrics and what we can provide for greater visibility into actually how long the log on duration is occurring in your environment. So instead of seeing like 200 seconds, if someone was sitting at the legal notice duration for 110 seconds, that will be subtracted and you'll get a more accurate time for how long your logons are. Um, FYI, at least in my research for legal notice, uh, there's a 120 second timeout. So after 120 seconds, it automatically declines and the user needs to click the resource again. Um, all right, so now we're moving on to one of the more exciting features that's been a part of this release, and that is PBS metrics. So I'm gonna switch over to our PBS folder here and just focus on it and click on machines here. All right, and so you can see my column preset. I've actually got the PBS metrics here um, already pre-selected. And so we are now querying uh, on both the PBS target device and on the PBS server, I believe, for some relevant PBS metrics to help you troubleshoot your environment. Uh, we can see we've got our five PBS servers here. Um, we can see you know, what hosts that they're on. So we can see if there's you know, a common thread between the good hosts and the poor hosts. Uh, on this particular one, we can see um, our host three has a VM that looks like it's quite sick, uh, but it's also got one that looks pretty good. And then we've got our VM host two that looked pretty average. Um, we've got this PBS target device health metric, which is another aggregate metric, which looks across the PBS metrics and gives you a score. This is all adjustable within our stress settings. So if I go ahead and click on these three little dots here, it actually breaks out why it thinks that this device is in a poor state. And for this one, it's saying that the PBS, uh, the UDP retry count has a load of two, adding onto that stress level. Uh, the device free space on the right cache drive is adding a load of one, and the PBS boot retry count is adding a load of two. So that's why this device is in a poor state. Um, if we look at like an average state, you can actually see it's got a different set of load values. So that's how this metric is calculated. Uh, the PBS server reconnect count. So I think this is getting pulled from the PBS server itself. So any few devices that are getting dropped from the PBS server, this count will start to increment as it's getting uh, load balance shifted around or whatever. PBS happens to do in order to keep uh, a machine up, but reconnecting to a different PBS server. Uh, we got the PBS device boot retry count. So this is as the device is booting up, it will, um, if it misses like a packet or something like that, it'll just uh, retry that, that packet. So this can add on to your logon duration or not your logon duration, sorry, your PBS boot device time. And you can see pretty substantially that this one actually in cause the, the PBS boot device time to be 158 seconds, or we should be looking at about 30 seconds normally. Um, and then the PBS device UDP retry count. So again, this is when uh, your PBS target device, it's looking for some data on the hard disk. Uh, it can't find it. It sends a message to the PBS server saying, hey, I need this piece of data. The PBS server doesn't get that message. And then the target device has to wait for some timeout and then it retries that request and then the PBS server sends it. So this is saying that this one particular device has 2,844 where the rest are in just a couple hundred to maybe just six. Um, usually this is pretty okay for the most part. What you wanna watch out for here is just the numbers incrementing really, really fast because that can 
imply that there might be a network issue in your environment, or maybe your host is overloaded. It's not able to service those requests before the, the UDP timeout or the IOP timeout occurs. Um, so something to watch out for and a really important metric to see at a high level. Uh, PVS RAM cache usage. So this one's kind of self-explanatory. When you define your PVS uh, image, you can define how much cache is on there. So for our devices, we have like 260 megabytes or so. And so you can see we're actually consuming all of the PVS RAM cache that's available to us. Um, PVS device free space on write cache. Again, another super critical uh, metric that tells you, you know, if you're running out of space, obviously if you run out of space on a PVS uh, device for the write cache, you're going to have a really bad day. So being able to track this metric and alert you on it, or even do some kind of remediation action if, if required, extending the disk or something like that, totally possible within control up and a really important metric to keep monitoring and keep in real time. Um, so again, PVS boot device, uh, PVS device boot time, uh, explain it a little bit earlier. We got our different PVS device types, whether it's VDisk or whether it's like local boot, uh, the disk mode. So we can see here, you know, we've got some inconsistency in our environment. Um, and again, just looking at it in control up, we can make that determination just at a glance. So super easy. So if someone needs to go log on to the PVS server and change our disk modes or change our target device modes from private to standard. So that way we have consistency. Um, PVS disk file name. So this is great if you create a new version, you boot up your PVS device. And, you know, if you're getting inconsistency in your environment or if you're doing it as part of like, you know, a Windows update and you're staggering that rollout, you can actually uh, see what disk the device is booted off of. And with control up, you know, we've got this awesome grouping feature where you can just drag this up top and then it'll sort or group by all the different devices you have. So in this particular one, we only have one image um, that's being presented there. So you only just see the one grouping. But if you had multiple, you'd be able to see them all at a high level glance really, really easily. Again, for consistency purposes, we can see the size of the right cache drive. And in this particular one, we can see we've got one at 22 gigs and the rest at 20. So if we want consistency in our environment, we need to go and remediate this issue. Okay, and then everything else I think is just the standard Citrix metrics. So that's our PVS, uh, new PVS metrics in a nutshell. So we think this is super exciting, PVS device version as well. So if you have different PVS tools, you can actually see that. Um, we think this is super exciting, super cool metrics, and we think that this will be able to help you uh, troubleshoot your environment. That's uh, that's great stuff. Uh, so there's actually a question, and uh, I know that uh, Yoni uh, is lurking on the call, so I'm going to allow him to talk because we might need, need his input. So the question is, um, will the um, uh, PVS retry counts be trended in insights? And I think the short answer is not at this at this time, but maybe Yoni can briefly talk about what we're doing as far as historical data. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Not sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, amazing. Zoom, huh? That's so bye bye to good old uh, go to webinar. Okay. Great, yeah, great. yeah, no longer. Good. No longer. Another nail in the Citrix coffee. No, I'm kidding. Citrix is still <laughs> forever, man. That, we love Citrix here. So, uh, just your question, Joel. Yeah, the good news is that uh, uh, the new you know, streaming data pipeline, which we are working on uh, uh, continuously, is becoming a reality. And it's going to include all the metrics you see in the real time uh, uh, grid. Right? So, not unlike the existing insights reports, where we have only partial coverage in the new data pipeline, which uh, uh, would be already open for some select design partners uh, in Q3, includes everything. So we already mapped the new PVS metrics. So the question is, yes, once the new data pipeline goes live, uh, this will include the PVS metrics historical data for sure. Okay. That's very useful. Now, now that you have to drop off, but is there a minimum PVS version required for this integration we just saw? Yeah, I think Trent probably knows, knows that. Yeah, well, more than I am. Sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think the the performance counters came out in seven eighteen, so pretty old at this point, I think. Um, but I'll, yeah, I can uh, double check and get that back. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Th thank you, Yoni, for chiming in. Uh, sure. Yeah, always nice to have a little little guest appearance here. So. <laughs> If you're on LTSR 1912 or greater, you'll definitely have these metrics. Before that, I think it was around that time, but that's for sure. Um, 
Okay, so next we have the triggers and script enhancements. Uh, this is another massive feature that probably should be, could, could have been put into a more major release, uh, but we put it in the minor one and I'm super excited to show this. So we added a new ability within our triggers feature. So our triggers is what we use for alerting and automation. Um, and one of the more cool things that we can do with it is obviously we can take remediative action, we can take optimization actions, or we can help augment your troubleshooting ability by once an incident occurs, start collecting all that information around that incident to help you troubleshoot further. And one of the things that we've done uh, is we've improved this trigger capability by adding another ability to it, another action that's capable. Uh, so I'm just going to look at this one particular one here, session state disconnected. So we added this capability called a webhook. And what this is, is this allows us to initiate a REST API call uh, once the trigger is activated. And then we're able to put any of the columns that you see here or potentially some metadata from the trigger itself into the, call, into the uh, REST API call so that way we can pass that information to whatever ingests REST API services. So let's just take a look at what this looks like. So I'm gonna edit the trigger here. This is our standard session state disconnected trigger. It's just looking for when someone becomes disconnected. Uh, so we're just focusing on our VDI environment within control up here. And this is actually another exciting new feature. We can actually do multi-select within the tree. Uh, so this action actually takes, or this trigger actually takes two actions that we're doing. So we're doing the adjust process party based on session state. So we optimize our environment here within our control of demo lab, where if a user becomes disconnected, we reduce all their process priority to below normal. Um, we also trim the process working state. So again, if they go disconnected, we trim the memory that the processes are consuming, freeing up that RAM for anyone else on the system. And new to 865 is now we can send a RESTful API request to a particular service. So looking at this one, we can see we're just doing a POST request. We can do POST, GET, PUT, DELETE. Uh, we specify the URL that we're, we're triggering here, and then you can define templates that you want to use uh, for these particular triggers. So what I'll do is I'll just manage this template so we can actually see what it looks like. And these are all the email templates that we have available within Control Up, and these are the new REST API hooks. Uh, so let's look at the Slack one. Now, if I hit edit here, we can see um, what we're putting to that REST API URL. So we're, we're sending data in a JSON format. Um, this is what the text says, so new control of notification. And then obviously from the URL that you're sending, usually there'll be some description as to what the data needs to look like. Uh, so you can see here, we're actually specifying the trigger name as a variable. So this is passing the trigger name to this particular notification. Um, we can see where we've got another variable name here, org name, and all of this is available. If you click on this variables, it'll take you to a web link telling you what's available to put into uh, the REST API calls. You can see source reported by, which particular object it is, and so on and so forth. So let's let's see what this looks like in action. So I'll just cancel out of all this. And then what I'm going to do is- I, I, can, gonna... uh, I have a session connected. Do you want me to- uh... Do you have a session connected? Okay, give me yeah, one second. Me... I'll, I'll actually disconnect you so we can actually watch it in real time with the right. cause and response. Okay, so is this your session, Joel? One ninety-one. Uh, I have an MCS one, so I don't know. Uh... Oh, I'm focused on PBS. Let me switch over my focus. There we go. That's probably the one. It's. Uh... I'll put it on the camera. So okay. people, people see it's real. So again, we're we're integrating with Slack uh, through that REST API call you saw through that template you saw. So this is our Slack demo environment here, and I'm just going to take. Joel session and just, oh, I logged him off. Sorry, Joel, my bad. Well, you have to do um, another session now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can, I can RDP to another one. Oh, 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 my notepads are gone. Oh, my, I'm on notes. <laughs> Not that guy. All right. So once my, once my session logs in, what we can do is we can disconnect it and control it will automatically pick up that the disconnect has occurred. And you can kind of see this here that you get those notifications happen almost immediately within just a couple seconds once the trigger picks up on the state change and so on and so forth. So now I'm gonna switch back here and let's focus on PBS and I'll look for my session here. 
So mine is at 192. That's this guy who's Explorer. So if I right click on him now and let's go disconnect, we'll see the session state will change to disconnect. And then Control will pick up on that. The trigger will pick up on that and boom, we get a notification almost, almost in real time. You saw how quick that was, right? That cause and effect, we, you get that notification as soon as it occurs. So this is super cool. So we can, we can tie into anything that has a REST API um, to be able to put information into it for you to ingest. So whether that's ServiceNow, PagerDuty, Slack, Teams, whatever you happen to, to want to integrate into, we can do that natively in the console through the triggers, super cool through automation. And then you can do whatever you want with that information. Uh, so we did improve the script engine as well. So I'm going to go into this. Um, so I'm just going to create a new script here. And I'm just going to type some data. This is all the same. And what we have is we've got this new execute script with a .NET engine. So it's just in preview right now. We're, we're working on this feature still, but we're, we're excited to see what people do with it. So essentially the way that we have executed scripts in the past is we've uh, saved the script file uh, to a directory within your machine or your user profile or, or whatever, and then we have PowerShell actually execute it. Um, the challenge there is that we can pass columns as data to the script as uh, parameters. And the challenge with those parameters is that sometimes it contains things like a, a username. And so we've had people tell us that they don't want that information being visible uh, within you know, task manager or the security log or whatever. And so what we have is we have this new .NET engine where we will actually execute it with our own built-in .NET engine uh, to execute the script. So this will uh, we'll still take the same parameters and we'll take all those variables and stuff, but we don't display it anywhere where it could be visible. So it's all encrypted within the control up execution itself. So along with that, we've actually added new features to the parameters as well. So we've got this capability where you can actually define a parameter name. Um, so control up the way that it worked before with PowerShell is that we were just using uh, positional parameters. So you would specify parameters. Actually, I, I've got a good example here with like, um, analyze logon duration. Where we have all these parameters and what we were doing in the past is we were defining these parameters and we were passing them um, just like this. So you'd see arguments one, arguments three, arguments five. These, these were all in the past uh, just being passed one at a time. So you'd see a script with values like three, six, 12, and then like client name or something like that. And the challenge there is that if a session was like disconnected, it might be missing the client name parameter. If something else was going on, it might be missing this other parameter. And so you needed to build a lot of logic into the script in order to do parameter counting, in order to see is the parameter valid for this particular uh, parameter that you're expecting. So is it an integer? Is it a string? Is it something like that? If it's unexpected, what do you do with it? Uh, so it, it added a fair bit of complexity to the scripts. And a way we worked around that with ALD is we started passing these parameters um, ahead of time uh, in preparation for this feature. Um, and so you can see that's why we have these captions like this. But in reality, what we're going to be doing is we're just going to be changing this. And we'll just say this will be uh, domain user. And then here we can actually uh, tell control up to take some kind of action. Um, depending on the state of the parameter. So if there is no value in the parameter, is if it's blank for whatever reason, we can say you pass an empty parameter. So we pass a parameter with just the double quotes and then you in your script, you would actually be getting a null value and you can do something you want with it. We can not pass the parameter. So if there's no value whatsoever, we just don't pass the parameter at all. Uh, and then the last one is we can actually just abort. So if, we, if the script requires information, we can just abort uh, the script and log off. And so we think that this feature is gonna be really powerful moving forward uh, once we start integrating all our scripts with it. And then if, as you're doing your debugging and troubleshooting of scripts too, to be able to use the parameter names and, and define them for your testing is actually quite, quite nice and quite simple. Okay, so that is that. So let's look at, no, I don't wanna delete it. 
Uh, so that's what's new with triggers and the script enhancements. Pretty exciting for what we can do for the engines there. Um, I don't know if Yoni's still on, but he's he's uh, really excited about this one particular feature. We've added new PowerShell commandlets to the control up monitor. And so what I'm going to do is I actually have a session on our control up monitor here. And I'm just going to show you the, the new commandlet. So it's called invoke CU query. And what it will do is it will interrogate our control up monitors for information. So uh, for example, if I want to if I want to get information on like the computers or if I want to see what uh, information is available within the computer objects that we have within control up, I can actually execute this command, not that guy. Let me do this guy. All right. And so what this will do is this tells the monitor, hey, show me all of the different properties that are available for the computer objects. So we can query on any one of these. And this is essentially all the columns you see within control up. So we can query for any one of these values. We can query individual users or machines or whatever. And we've actually built logic into this script that allow you to, to do some kind of um, uh, some kind of further translation there. So uh, we're looking at the computer objects and now let's look at session objects so you can kind of see all the data that's available and so let's look at the sessions field as well and again we're querying for all the different data that's available within the sessions field so you can see all of these individual columns here you know you can get the wi-fi signal strength or whatever you can query for individual users user input delay cp utilization you know all of these really cool metrics all through powershell all through uh, the control and monitor service uh, so let's look at some real examples here so one of the things I want to do is I want to view the status of all the user sessions uh, in a human readable form. So I'll go and try to paste this in here. Try that again. OK. And so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm invoking CU query. I'm looking at the, the main display. I'm looking at the at the sessions view, and I'm grabbing the server name, the session ID, the connect state, uh, and so on and so forth. And so boom, you can see here all the different information we get. Um, so here we're looking at you know the server name. Uh, here's our session ID for all those individual sessions. Here's the different connection states. So whether it's active, disconnected, or just connected. So usually these connected ones, session ID one, usually system. So system usually lives in just a connected state, not an active or disconnected state. Uh, so pretty cool. We get some interesting information here that we can look at for the sessions. And you can see at the, the end, we sorted by the description that might exist within that field. Uh, so I'm going to look at another example here. So we're going to display all the machines with more than two CPUs. So again, invoke CU query. We're looking at the computers table when we're looking at these particular fields, the name, the CPU count, and here's where we're adding a little bit of logic so you can filter out on this. So you can actually look for when the CPU count is greater than two, and then we'll look at the, the data output. So I hit enter here, boom, these are all the machines within our environment that have a CPU count greater than two. So we can see you know, a variety of fours, there's an eight in there, so maybe uh, worth investigating why that one's an eight. Oh, it's a Horizon uh, 2019 server, so multi-session server makes sense. So you can kind of see, you can kind of tease out the information that you can pull from control up programmatically now through PowerShell. Uh, I've got another um, example here. And on this one, I'm going to actually define uh, the fields um, as a hash table here. So boom, we're gonna look for CPU usage, name, product version, server name, and the account name. Uh, I'm actually gonna look for just a max value of 10. So I only want 10 results to be displayed. And here I'm going to execute uh, my last query here. So again, invoke CU query. I'm looking for the fields variable, which is all these fields defined here. You can see I'm looking at the main, the processes uh, table itself. Those, so the processes view that you see within control up. And again, we're only going to take 10, 10, uh, the max value that we defined earlier. And we're going to look at where CPU usage is greater than zero. And we're going to sort by CPU usage. So you're actually going to get all the values from the control monitor of all the sessions as they exist in this state um, and the processes there. So boom, here's our, our values almost immediately. We can see you know, someone's running Internet Explorer and it's consuming 50% of the CPU, probably a problem to look at there. 
Uh, we can see we've got some Linux processes because, of course, we integrate in with Linux. Um, we can see the system process on that RDS Tools 01. So that's just it managing all of those different IO operations that it's doing. Uh, again, another Linux machine and then some other processes that are consuming uh, CPU. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, if you want to explore this commandlet further as to what you can pull out and send to other, you know, um, pieces of information, some customers own things like Tableau where they want to visualize it there, but they, uh, the exports are maybe a bit too much information for them to do. They can now run this on like a schedule or something like that and output that data to them. If you want full help on this command, so get help invoke CU query dash full, will give you a good output for everything that uh, this does. And so you can see all the different parameters that we define. We can see the description of the help itself. And then as well online, we have uh, help with this commandlet on the support.controlup.com website. So really cool if you want to integrate in some other third-party technologies within ControlUp. This is a really, really powerful way of doing so. Hey, uh, hey Trenton, uh, let me uh, uh, grab you there because there were a bunch of questions. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, I just want to make sure that I provided the right answer to one of the questions. Uh, this is all coming from the in-RAM database on the monitor. Right, so there's no like new database on the disk. It's all kind of like real time or live from the monitor. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So this is all. This is all, all the monitors. So if you have a monitor cluster, it'll query all of them and it'll present you the information there. Okay, yeah. and that's still in in real time every three seconds. That's right. Yeah. So for instance, like if I go back to uh, this process is one, and if I just keep executing it, you'll actually see I get different results each time because it's it's real time right right and um is it possible to and i i wasn't paying attention to your demo because i was looking at the question so um for example can you also get a list of all computers that have more than x amount of cpu or x amount of ram uh, can you kind of like at you know in your query uh certain filters yes yeah, and that's actually um, what you see here, right? So in this particular one, we can actually see uh, that we're, the where is exactly what you're describing. So that's the filter that we're searching for. So in this particular one, we're looking at CPU usage is greater than zero. So you could search for number of cores is greater than two. I think that was actually part of a previous example. So yes, we can do logical operations. Okay, and then uh, one that is not, particular for this one, I think uh, when you were going through the triggers, uh, somebody asked in the chat uh, uh, about, can I make a rule that if the CPU is running at X percentage for an X amount of seconds, then export the description of the process to somewhere? Yeah, you can do that within the trigger. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm not entirely sure what they mean when they say description. I mean, imagine they mean like the properties, but yes. Yeah, I mean, I think the process information in real time, you know, we have a field there. I, I, my, my, I accidentally, you locked me off. So my, my real time console is gone. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay. And then um, can we uh, relate it to kind of like the real time question? Can we get real time data from vCenter? Uh, yes. So the vCenter API, I believe I it's, uh, 20 seconds. It's, it's 20 seconds. Yeah. And I think that's a, an API limitation on VMware's part. But 20 seconds is still pretty pretty close to real time, pretty relevant information there. And yes, you can query that information, but it's only updated every 20 seconds. All right. Sorry, there's two more questions, but we'll see if we have time at the end because I know that you still have some content to, to go through. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the new commandlet in a nutshell. Really excited to share that with you. Um, you know, the, the ability to query the actual control of data itself and pull that information out and then integrate it in with other services is something we had quite a few requests for. So we're really excited to, to deliver this. Um, moving on, we actually have, uh, I just need to switch. All right. So the last thing I want to touch on is we've enabled a new integration into VR Ops. Um, so again, talking about the third-party integrations with the commandlets, 
Um, we've been working with VMware. We've got a really strong, solid partnership with them. And one of their asks is, you know, we love the control product. We love the data that it's providing, but lots of our customers have VR ops and that's their, their main use case uh, for looking at historical data. So is there a way we can integrate control up with VR ops? And the answer is yes, we've come up or we're coming out, uh, I believe within just a couple of weeks or so with the VMware vRealize Operations Manager pack for control up. Uh, and so let's just go over some of the screenshots as to what kind of information you can see there. Okay, so oh, I'm flipping through here a little quick. Okay, so what you can see, so you can, this is the kind of visualizations you see within VR ops. So we, we got all the standard, you know, control of sessions. We're pulling in the aggregate metrics as well. Um, it may not explain out what those metrics mean, but they're there within VR ops. So that way you can actually see whether what the states were in when that um, metric was collected in that point of time. Um, you can see we have all the, the whole list of all the different metrics we provide. So land latency, session latency, internet latency is an example. Uh, switching over to the main dashboard view, we have more displays here. So we can see, again, aggregates of the client device scores that we're providing, the user experience device or the user experience scores that we're providing, top CPU usage, top memory utilization, top disk utilization. You can click on all the different pools and objects, uh, folder structures within the, the control of console um, that we're delivering for this particular view. So again, scrolling down a little bit, we can see more. You can see these beautiful visualizations, these heat maps that VR Ops provides. Um, so you can actually get a sense for the health in your environment at a glance. And again, just a little more uh, heat mapping displays that you can see. And then moving down further, we're now into the user experience dashboard. So here we're looking at uh, you know a lot of the same stuff, but more user focused now. So top five processes, memory utilization disk, and then for users themselves, we can see you know, the average log on duration, number of active sessions, processes, average client Wi-Fi signal strength, all of this um, within VR ops, data from control up. And again, this is historical information that we're outputting to, to VR ops. So you can actually select the different date ranges as well. So again, moving down into the user experience dashboard, we can look at some of these more visualizations that we're providing. And again, these are the aggregate uh, you see these within Solve. Obviously, a big difference is uh, within Solve, we can actually click on these metrics and it drills you in to, to them with the focus. Um, with this, you're just getting the metrics and the ability to, to see them visually. Okay. So we can see more uh, displays that VR Ops is capable of down at the bottom here. We got the average protocol throughput, um, log on duration, protocol latency. So you know they got some really nice stuff here where you can actually see when the metric starts to change over time. Okay, and scrolling down a little bit further, you can see we got a couple more. So the average app load time for this environment was about four seconds the entire time, top five applications. And then lastly, we've got the VMware dashboard that we're providing to VR ops as well. So this is VMware specific for Horizon, showing you information about your Horizon environment, at least as, as control of the text it, uh, uh, to display more rich information as to how your the health of your horizon environment. So yeah, you can see the machine stats here, all the different visualizations. Again, that heat map to give you an idea for the health of it. So all of that is capable within control up. Uh, continuing down again, we got the, the log on durations for this particular one is all zero seconds, but it should show you the proper log on duration. Um, this is the overall folder of whatever metric we happen to be looking at. It was actually, we scrolled down just a little bit too far to see it, but you can see again, it. It's got that point in time, your start of day, and then how that metric changes over time. Uh, again, connection server machine stats, memory CPU utilization disk, all of those important metrics to see visually so that way you know how, how your environment is performing. All right, actually, I'm gonna pass it back to you at this point, Joel. Okay, so uh, I know that we're almost out of time. We did have a couple of questions left, but what we will do is uh, we will, uh, um, uh, follow up on that because we we do want to stay within the time, so we'll uh, uh, we'll 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 post something somewhere um, or follow up by email on these outstanding questions. Uh, uh, so let me bring this to the finish line. Um, okay, there we go. All right. So um, so what we listened to today is. 
a, an update to our real-time DX platform, which is our DX management solution for VDI and DAS over your Citrix, your VMware Horizon, uh, um, and AVD environments. Uh, so a lot of good stuff. Now, for those people that wonder, like, how do I get my hands on that? That's actually very simple. You just go to controller.com, click on the download now or download here. I can't remember which words we exactly use, but it's like right in your face on our homepage. And uh, it will immediately get you a copy. Uh, nothing you need to do, no registration or anything like that. Uh, you can just uh, um, uh, get it from right there. If you're interested in looking at any of our other solutions around physical endpoints, SaaS and web applications, and our upcoming unified communications monitoring, um, please reach out to your, your, your account team or keep an eye on our blog. We have a bunch of new things coming uh, very soon, so we will uh, go into more detail tomorrow on our blog on some of these solutions. So uh, if you are unable to type, then you can scan these QR codes and it will bring you right to our website. Uh, and that brings us here to the end. And I would like to thank Trenton, first of all, for, for these great demos and um, everybody here in the audience uh, for the great questions. Uh, I know that we didn't get to all the uh, questions, but like I said, we will follow up uh, on, uh, on these outstanding questions. So I wish everybody a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.